What do you think of the doctrine of the virgin birth? Important? Critical? Why is it in scripture? Now, it's one of those great doctrines that we get, of course, from Christmas. The virgin birth is fundamentally tied to the first Christmas. And it's a very important doctrine, probably second only after the incarnation, which we talked about last week. Now, the virgin birth, simply defined, is that miraculous conception. Mary is conceived in a miraculous way by the Holy Spirit. She becomes pregnant with the Lord Jesus Christ while still a virgin. This is found both taught in Old and New Testaments. We read again from our call to worship, Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, one of the great Christmas prophecies in the Old Testament. Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son, and she will call his name Emmanuel. And as we read in today's sermon text, Matthew 1, verse 18, now the birth of Jesus was as follows. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. Now, please note, the virgin birth is not, is not the doctrine of the perpetual virginity of Mary, the teaching that Mary remains a virgin for the rest of her life, nor is it the doctrine of the immaculate conception, the notion that Mary is free from original sin from the moment of her conception. The, the immaculate conception is about Mary's conception, the virgin birth is about Jesus' conception. Now, the perpetual virginity of, of Mary and the Immaculate Conception are doctrines from the Roman Catholic tradition, one which Protestants reject because it's not found in Scripture. So today, I want to take a look at the virgin birth, but let's start with the family. Let's start with Mary, and let's start with Joseph, and just give a little bit of their background. Mary, as we read in Scripture, is obviously a young Jewish woman probably from the tribe of Levi. She's a resident in Nazareth, an unremarkable town in Galilee, which is the northern part of Israel. Her cousin is Elizabeth, who will be the mother of John the Baptist. And after, as you read through scripture, um, after the birth of Jesus, Mary and Joseph will have children in the normal way, which is no surprise, because that's a good thing. As for Joseph, he's clearly residing in Nazareth, and he's engaged to Mary. He is a craftsman, a skilled builder, probably in the medium of wood. He was originally, though, from Bethlehem, that great city of David, that birthplace of King David. Joseph and Mary had to return to Bethlehem, as you all know the story as you continue to read, because of a census. They had to go to Joseph's hometown to register for taxation purposes. And, of course, in Bethlehem, is where our Lord Jesus was born and all that story we hear every single Christmas about the inn and the manger and things of that nature. The critical thing, though, is the Old Testament prophesies, prophesies that the Messiah will come from Bethlehem. And as we talked about last week of equal critical importance is that Joseph is from that royal line of David. It is from the line of David that you will get the Messiah, the anointed one that will save his people. Now, Joseph probably dies before Jesus becomes, well, becomes 30 and engages in his public ministry because Joseph simply just disappears from the story. Now, Joseph and Mary together, as we read in our text, are betrothed. Now, this is a little bit different. Actually, it's a lot different than a modern engagement. By ancient Jewish cultures, when you're betrothed, it's much more a formal and legal thing than just simply a modern engagement. The couple is viewed as basically legally joined. In some ways, they're married, though they haven't physically come together as man and wife. And you read that in our text. Take a look at verse 18. It says, Joseph is her husband. But if you go and read the verse before in Matthew 17, it says Mary was betrothed to Joseph, but they had not come together as of yet, as we read in the text. So it's this legal arrangement it's a contractual arrangement that they will get married within a year, and it takes a legal action to terminate that contract. They actually have to get divorced to end this contractual relationship. And as we read in the text, there is a huge problem. Mary becomes pregnant before the wedding. 
Now, virginity is one of the most important virtues an unmarried young woman has. And as we read throughout scripture, as we heard in our scripture reading, you know, Jesus taught it's a most grievous sin to go against this. And as we read in our sermon text, it's one of the only, if not the main, it's the main reason, if not the only reason you can have a legitimate divorce. And of course, adultery breaks that one of the top 10 commandments of God. This is a huge problem for Joseph, that Mary is pregnant and not by him and not be and before the wedding and obviously by someone else. She's an adulteress. And by the way, virginity is a virtue. It's not some outdated, antiquated sexist belief that we now as moderns have to reject. It's commanded throughout both Old and New Testaments. We read in the New Testament, Paul commands older women to train younger women to love their husbands, to love children, and to encourage them in purity. And virginity, virginity before marriage is commanded for everyone, men and women. As I like to say, biblical sexuality is very simple. Total abstinence outside of marriage, total monogamy within marriage. And as I've argued in other sermons, though it's a sin for both to engage in fornication, it's actually more dangerous for society for women to be prosperous, for women to sleep around. Because why? Why does the Bible put such focus on virginity when it comes to women? Because women create life. Men can't do that. Women create life and women create the home. They're made to do this and they do it well. And it's such a critical thing for society to have the next generation in a clear line and to have godly homes that are safe and welcoming places. This is a huge gift given to women. And so therefore, for society, to have women go astray on this causes more problems. And I've likened it, if you want, the opposite of courage and cowardice. It's a sin for both genders to be cowardice, but it's much more dangerous for society when men are cowards. And if you run into someone who says, wait a minute, there's all this virginity talk, you know, come on, that's just antiquated stuff. It's unnatural. If someone ever asks you that, if you want to get a little bold, just ask a question. You're going to get a little bold here. And say, really, it's unnatural. Question, are you using birth control? If they say yes, I'm like, well, isn't that unnatural? Why are you doing something that's breaking this natural sequence up? So you have this huge problem by biblical standards, old and new, that Mary seems to be an adulteress. Now, Joseph, as we read in the text, is a righteous man. So, of course, he's not going to marry Mary. She has grievously violated the marriage covenant. She has violated one of the Ten Commandments. And as we read in the New Testament, Hebrews 3, 13, verse 4, marriage is to be held in honor among all. And the marriage bed is to be undefiled for fornicators, those who have relations before marriage, and adulterers, those who break their marriage covenant, God will judge. But yet we read in verse 19, and Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her, planned to send her away secretly. So here, Joseph is being holy, but he's also being gracious. And a grace, of course, is undeserved charity. He decides to divorce her, and the text here literally means divorce, quietly, privately, so that she would not face public humiliation or maybe criminal prosecution. But we, the reader, know that something else is up because Matthew is telling us what's really going behind, what's really happening in the story. We read because in Matthew 1.18 that Mary is not an adulteress. She is miraculously pregnant by the Holy Spirit, and therefore she's still a virgin, though pregnant. And if you read verse 20 on, we get even more information about this because the angel of the Lord shows up and tells Joseph directly. And he's a righteous man and he obeys, but that's for another sermon. But why is this virgin birth so important? Because for the last, ooh, I don't know, 200 or so, maybe 300 years, 
there's been a steadily, steadily attack on the virgin birth, that it's really not that important. And starting in the 18th century, and especially in the early 20th century, it became quite fashionable in mainline churches to question the virgin birth. I mean, do you really have to believe in the virgin birth to be a good Christian? Isn't that kind of superstitious? That a woman can be pregnant and still a virgin? I mean, that's not rational. That's not with the times. I mean, I can still do good works and be a good Christian and not believe in this Iron Age myth. And you'll hear frequently in mainline churches, the focus of the Christmas story becomes, well, it's really about a poor homeless couple and this brave woman who had a child outside of wedlock. Let me quote my mother, hogwash. It's interesting though, where this comes from though, because it comes from a different translation of the Bible. And you see that in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. When you go read more conservatively translated Bibles, like the King James Version, the New King James Version, our pew Bibles, the NSAB or the ESV, it always reads, virgin. Behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son, and she will call his name Emmanuel. If you go read more, I use the word modern translations, more correctly, more theologically liberal translations, like the RSV, the NRSV, or the Good News Bible, it says, young woman. Behold, a young woman will be with child and bear a son, and she will call his name Emmanuel. Forgive me, we need to take a tangent and do a deep dive into Isaiah 7.14 to unpack this, because this is so important, because we're dealing with the Word of God. Isaiah chapter 7, 14, we hear it every Christmas. It's one of those great messianic prophecies about the virgin birth. But it's critical to note something about Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. It's talking about two different children at two different times. A lot of times when we read Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, we do a disservice to the church. We read just that one verse, and we don't read around it. So we read around it, something else is also going on. When you read Isaiah chapter 7 closely, we read that the southern kingdom of Judah, and this is some 700 years before the birth of Christ, is being attacked by two kingdoms, Aram, and the northern kingdom of Israel. It gets a little confusing. Israel can mean the whole thing or just the northern kingdom of Samaria. So here, Aram and Samaria are attacking Judah. And the king of Judah, Ahaz, who is an evil king, as the Bible warns us, is greatly worried because his two kingdoms are attacking his one kingdom. And so to comfort Ahaz, God, through the prophet Isaiah, offers a sign that there will be victory, that Judah will be saved. But Ahaz, Ahaz refuses. and God is offended. And yet, in grace, still gives a great sign. Let me read that text again. It's Isaiah 7, 13 through 16. <clears throat> then he, Isaiah, said, listen now, O house of David. Notice the focus on David, the kingship of David. Is it too slight a thing for you to try the patience of men that you will try the patience of my God as well? Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin or a young woman talk about her in a second, will be with child and bear a son, and she will call his name Emmanuel, which is God with us. But keep on reading. He will eat curds and honey. At the time he knows enough to refuse evil and choose good. For behold, the boy will know enough to refuse evil and choose good. The land whose two kings, Aram and Samaria, you dread, will be forsaken. So question for you, who's prophesied here? Someone born in Isaiah's time, some 700 years before Jesus Christ? Or is it talking about the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ? It's my favorite theological answer. Doesn't answer every question, but many. The answer is yes. It's both. That's the only way that all of scripture becomes fulfilled. In the narrow sense, it's clearly talking about a child born in Isaiah's time. 
It's a sign of Judah's being delivered in the political earthly sense from these two evil kings. It will take time, though. They have to wait. Judah has to wait. How long? Well, as long as the birth from a child to the age of discernment. Eh, about 12 years, maybe. And after that time, the two kings that threaten Judah will be stopped. God will stop them. And therefore, Ahaz and his kingdom of Judah has to be patient and trust in God. And God will greatly bless Judah with worldly salvation, earthly salvation. This political problem will go away. This child, born in Isaiah's time, doesn't necessarily have to be born of a virgin. Again, it's about the length of the child that's important, the length of that time span from birth to discernment. Some have even speculated by ancient tradition, maybe it was a child born from Isaiah and his wife. And here, the word virgin does mean a general word. It's not a technical term, it's a very broad term. It literally means a young woman of meritable age. It doesn't exclude being a virgin, but it refers to any young woman who can get married. Probably the best translation is maiden, which implies virgin, but there's another Hebrew word that narrowly means virgin. However, if you only go with it being a child born in Isaiah's time, it doesn't work. There's no child in Isaiah's time that, fit, that fits the broad meaning of this prophecy. There's no child in the Old Testament named Emmanuel. And if you read in Isaiah 8.8, 8, the child will have the land. And if you keep on reading, the child is implied to be the Messiah. And the child is supposed to be literally God with us, which is an extraordinary title. Isaiah, and if you read through Isaiah through his whole book, he speaks more about the Messiah than any other Old Testament writer. And the Messiah is going to be the Savior of all of God's people. And there's no Old Testament child who is born of the virgin. That's why for the ancient Jews, even before the time of, a, of Jesus, they thought Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14 was talking about a child, the Messiah, born from a virgin. How do I know that? If you go read the Old Testament in Greek, the Old Testament is originally written in Hebrew, but in the 3rd and the 2nd century B.C., before Christ, 70 Jewish scholars got together and put the Jewish writings into Greek. It's called the Septuagint. And when they wrote out the Septuagint, again, before the birth of Christ, when they hit Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, the Greek word they decided to use was virgin. The exact same word Matthew 1 and Luke 1 uses for the Virgin Mary. So the correct way to translate this, if you take the word of God in whole, is a virgin. That's how that text should be translated. The word here, yes, is broad. It can mean virgin, but when you take a look at the whole thing, taking Isaiah, Old and New Testament together, clearly we're talking about this child being born of a virgin. Oh, and by the way, this notion that prophecy has many layers, that's common. When you read through your prophecies in the Old and New Testament, this is the norm. Frequently, prophecy has a very narrow fulfillment and a broader fulfillment a narrow Old Testament historical fulfillment, and a broader New Testament fulfillment. Since the 19th century, all too often, I think sometimes we want just simple wooden prophecy, one simple meaning. That's not how the Bible works normally. Prophecy usually has a much more profound and deep meaning that has several layers. And just think of the prophecy Ahaz has gets. Because Ahaz like, no, 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 I don't want to test God, he says in a flippant way. He has no idea the power of the prophecy he's receiving. Not only that he'll be okay in his kingdom from these two evil kings, the greater king, a king far greater than Ahaz is coming. And that's going to require Christmas some 700 years in the future. So why is the virgin birth so important? Well, Let's state something very simple. It's in the Bible. Now, I grant you, belief in the virgin birth doesn't save you. Only trust in Christ saves you. And 
For those who are new to the faith, the church should be a safe place to work out their faith, to ask questions. Like, really? Pregnant and still a virgin? How that works? Let's have that conversation. However, if you're a mature Christian, you cannot reject this doctrine. Because there's no reason to. It's a required doctrine of the faith. And if you overtly teach against it, that should bring church discipline. There's no reason to reject this. It's clearly taught in the Bible, Old and New Testaments. And why would you reject something that's supernatural? I mean, are you saying God can't do miracles? If you say that, you throw everything out in the Bible. There's no earthly logical reason to reject this doctrine. And we certainly don't want to be like the ungodly Ahaz and try the patience of our God and ignore the profound blessings that God is with us. But the virgin birth also shows godliness. And in our sermon text today, Joseph and Mary, and particularly Joseph, Joseph has that beautiful balance of holiness and charity, which is sometimes so hard to keep going at the same time. Because sometimes that zeal for holiness and that compassion and charity, sometimes in our earthly minds seem to hit against each other. But here he has great holiness. He has that fear of God, that love of God, that first of the great commandments. You know, he's not going to marry an adulteress. That's wrong. It's a violation of God's law. Not going to happen. He takes the marriage covenant seriously, as God does. But yet, he shows charity, a love of neighbor. He's going to privately send Mary away and not publicly disgrace her. But above all, he has faithful obedience. When God speaks in the case of Joseph, an angel appears and tells him what's really going on, again in the future sermon, he obeys and follows. It's so important to get that order right. That's why our, our banner outside says, love the Lord thy God. That's the first and greatest commandment. When you, when you mess around loving God and getting God right, it trickles down. And you see that in the mainline churches. You know, in the 19th and 20th century, when they started to retranslate Isaiah 714, going away from a supernatural, a biblical reading, they started watering down the doctrine of the virgin birth. And if you look, go back and look at those churches in the 40s and the 50s, they had solid morality, but they started weakening the theological foundations. But when you weaken the theological foundations, eventually you weaken the morality. If you lose the love of God, you'll lose the love of neighbor. And it's not surprising that those churches that rejected the virgin birth, or at least watered down and said, yeah, don't worry about it, leave what you want. Now they're full bore against the institution of marriage and the family itself. One follows the other. Because theology drives morality. I'll say it again. Theology always drives morality. Everything's theological. The question is whether you have bad theology, and then eventual bad morality, or do you have good theology based upon the revelation of God, and from that comes godliness. That's fundamental. So this obscure doctrine, at least to the modern mind, is so important. Why else is it important? Well, as Pastor Dan so frequently and wonderfully points out, it's a fulfillment of prophecy, and that should encourage us. We read in the Old Testament that God will be with us. There will be a miracle birth, and it happens in the New Covenant. Oh, and that should bring us encouragement. But above all, why a virgin birth is so important is it's required for the gospel. I've said this many, many times, but it's so critical. The only way a just and good God can redeem, the only way a just and good God can forgive is through someone who is fully God, fully man, and without sin. God must punish sin if he's good and just. And the only hope we have is someone who is fully man, who can take on all the sins of humanity. We need a someone who is without sin, so he can be the perfect sacrifice. And we need someone who is fully God, because only God can take on God's wrath. That's only really possible, if you think about it, because of the virgin birth. That Jesus is the God-man, that Jesus is special, that Jesus is unique, and he alone can save.
And so when you start tinkering with the virgin birth, you tinker with the gospel itself. So attack on the virgin birth is not only the attack on the authority of scripture, it's attack on the gospel. But when you embrace it, oh my. How do we know that Christ is our Savior? Because he was born of the virgin. How do we know that? It was prophesied in the old and fulfilled in the new. We have the full word of God that testifies to Christ. And because our salvation is based not on ourselves, but on him who is perfect, we can have full assurance. Our king was born of the virgin. Our king is fully man, fully God, and without sin. And therefore, when he says we are saved, when he does his work of salvation, it's perfect. And therefore, we can rest in that. The doctrine of the virgin birth seems like an obscure secondary doctrine. It's not. It touches on the very foundations of the authority of Scripture and the gospel itself. And besides, it's beautiful. And it means we can trust in God's word and above all, trust in Christ and come to his table, this royal table, and receive his grace and know that we are redeemed because our Savior is perfect, because he is God, because he is fully man, and because he is without sin. Why? Prophesied in Scripture. He was born of a virgin. Amen.